How's everybody today? Pretty good? Everybody stand up, turn to your neighbor, said, man, I never thought you could look so good. It's a shocker. All right, let's, let's pray and uh, get our hearts ready this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness, your grace. It's a privilege to come into your house and to worship you. Lord, your word says that you are our sanctuary, our strong tower, and we can run into you, and there we are rescued. And so, Lord, as we come here today physically, let us be here mentally and emotionally and spiritually. Help us to open our hearts and our minds to receive you as you are, the God who loves us, the God who died for us, the God who would do anything for us. And, Lord, we pray that as we worship today, we would worship with all of our hearts. Lord, as we, as we, we give our offerings, Lord, that we would give, not because you need the money, but because you have been so good to us, just as a way of saying thanks. Lord, as we hug one another today, smile with one another, greet each other in the peace of Christ, Lord, we do it because you have been good to us. And, Lord, that's our testimony, that you have won the victory. The enemy has been crushed, the enemy has been defeated, and we have victory in Jesus' name. And so, Lord, we come here to celebrate, we come here to worship, we come here to love one another and to love you. Lord, we give you this time, and we dedicate ourselves to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And it's in your mighty name we pray. And everybody said together, amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a praise off. And amen. Darkness run for cover, but the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. Believe in signs and wonders, have resurrection power. Still the miracle. That
is good. All the time. Man, you guys look great. I can't see you, but I can tell you look great. Hey, we want to have a little bit of hello time. This is complicated for many people, but let me make it simple. You walk around, you say, hey, hello, right? Let's practice. Ready? Hey, hello. All right, let's do it. downloaded our church center app i do want to encourage you to download the church center app we have tons of events coming up as we head into summer um, events for everyone for all ages uh, you know everyone here has a place so check out our church center app for all of our events and all of our ministries um, i do want to highlight a few one that we have is our crisis care kits if you grabbed one of those bags in in recent weeks or if you still want to grab one as you head out um, we create the crisis care kits uh, just to to give out you know on natural disasters when there's emergencies you know um, different things going on our district sends them out to those people in need so uh, we will need them back by this coming sunday it's the deadline because we have to deliver them the following week so it's not too late for you to grab one of those or to bring yours back if you already grabbed a bag we also have an event to uh, minister to the homeless um, our servants of the lord ministry puts that on every few weeks and uh, they basically go out and feed the homeless so if that's something that god is tugging on your heart for that may be the ministry for you so check that out we also have a marriage date night coming up is anyone excited about that Yes? Yes. So it's in May, and it is a, a Christian comedy and music night. So um, spaces are limited. So if that's something that you're interested in, get signed up today um, because we will run out of spots. We're only uh, at so many spots. So check that out on the app. And we also have a Crossroads family lunch coming up the first week in June. It's going to be kind of a pot, like, potluck style. So come uh, 
fellowship for us to come together. Um, we'll have inflatables for the kids. We'll have some fun activities for us to, to partake in and just to fellowship in, in a meal. So uh, get signed up for that as well. And I do want to let you know that if you want to give to the ministry here at Crossroads, you can do that on the Church Center app under the Give. Uh, you can go to our website, crossroadscommunitychurch.net, and there's a link there. Or you can give with the envelopes in front of you. And as you head out, you can put them in the boxes as you head out in, 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 into the foyer. Amen. 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 God is good all the time. Amen. I, I do want to take just a minute and uh, pray. And uh, you've seen the news and everything going on all over the world. And I want to just stop and, and pray over the situation in the Middle East right now with Israel. And uh, the scripture says that those who bless Israel will be blessed and those who curse will be cursed. And uh, we follow the scripture, so we su support them. And, uh, but we know anytime there's war, it's not good. A lot of people getting hurt. And so let's just stop and pray for a minute. Heavenly Father, we want to lift this situation up to you. We pray, Lord, that you are, are omniscient, you're omnipresent. You are able. And Lord, this is a situation that no man has an answer for. It's been like this for as long as we can remember. But we know you are still God. So we lift up the nation of Israel. We lift up all those everywhere that are being affected and hurt. Oh, we pray even for those who want to do harm, Lord, that you would reveal yourself to them. Lord, the Apostle Paul trying to persecute the church and he sees the light and, and it changes everything. Lord, you're still able to do that today. And we pray that you would do it. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah, give the Lord a praise offering. Amen. In just a little while, we're going to take communion, and uh, communion is a time of uh, remembering. Jesus said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And I want to read to you what he said in John chapter 6. He says, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Amen. This was a strange thing because the Mosaic law at that time is if you ate anything that had any blood left in it, if it wasn't thoroughly drained and thoroughly cooked, then it was against the law to eat. And then you have Jesus showing up and saying, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And it messed with people a lot. Jesus has a way of messing with people, amen? <laughs> and it messed with them. But, but the symbolism of what he's saying is you have to take all of me. If you want life, you have to take all of me. And so many of us have tried to take a little and not all. And we've had a little bit of faith, but we haven't been all in. And then we wonder, where is God? But the, tr the reality is you have to take all of him in order to experience all of him. And so I want to encourage you as we prepare for communion, ask yourself if you're doing that. And maybe today you need to renew your commitment to Christ. Maybe you need to make a commitment that you never have where you would say, Lord, I want to take you all in as my Lord and Savior. So as we sing this song, just let that be a prayer time for you. Amen. Let's sing this together. Oh, yeah. 
Amen. Amen. And Jesus, in the upper room, he brought his disciples together, and he took the bread, and he broke it, and he gave thanks. And um, I'm, I'm reminded every time we do this that we are to learn how to give thanks for broken things. And if there's something broken in your life today, we don't want it. We didn't like it. We don't like it now. But it's actually the pain that reminds us that we need God. It's the pain that brings us back to him. And as long as we keep coming back to him, then we'll overcome and we'll continue to live the life that he has for us. And we'll experience more joy and peace. But we have to learn how to be grateful when everything is bad. And so as we eat today, let us remember that it was on the cross when everything was bad for Jesus. And he could have gotten off the cross, he could have left, but instead he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Let's eat together. And he took the wine and he said, this is my blood and the blood of the new covenant. Christ lived a perfect life, which means he fulfilled the law. The law that was broken by Adam was fulfilled by Jesus. So that any who have faith in him are no longer living by the law, which means if you mess up, therefore there is now no condemnation from God because we live under grace. Amen. And we, so let's remember the cross today, not only as, as a, an emblem of his love, but for what it did for us spiritually. It removed us from the, the law that said you had to do everything perfect all the time. So now we can rest. And God is saying, just do the best you can. And he accepts that. Amen. Amen. Let's drink together. Heavenly Father, we thank you. In the end, Lord, you did not create us for anything but communion, that we would be interwoven with your spirit, that we would know your presence. You've reminded us that when we pray, we should pray our Father that, to remember that we're not alone, that we've come here today as a family of God, a body, and we have other believers, brothers and sisters around us all the time. So no matter what we're going through in, in this difficult life, we're never alone. And you're our Father. You are the one who loves us. And Lord, I pray for any today that didn't have a father, whose father wasn't there, whose father did not love well. Lord, I pray that you would allow them to see that you have been a father to them the whole time. In everything that could have happened, in every direction their life could have gone, because you're a good father, you put people in place at just the right time to bring them back. And so Lord, none of us can stand here and take credit for the life you have given us. We all recognize that it's by your grace and your grace alone. And we give you all the praise. All we want, God, is to be with you. It's in your name we pray. And everyone said together, Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a praise offering. Amen. Amen. As we continue to worship this morning, the song we're going to sing says, I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda. I'm sorry when I forgot that you're enough. Take me back to where it started. I just want you, nothing else. I don't know where you're at in your life, what you're dealing with, but let's just take a minute to remember what Jesus did on that cross for each and every one of us and just leave it at his feet to remind ourselves that he wants us and nothing else. And we should want him and nothing else. Just one. 
notice that uh, we've gone from winter to summer, and in that in-between phase, it seems like the weather is really very erratic, where some days we can feel the warmth of the sun, and some days we can't. And that has nothing to do with the sun. It is shining just as bright and just as hot as it ever was. So sometimes that kind of reminds me of how we feel God's presence at times. Sometimes we feel close, we feel Him, and other times we don't. He has never changed. So I think many times uh, that's a matter of the distractions we've allowed in our lives. It has nothing to do with God. Like the world is designed to keep us busy, not productive. It's designed to keep us distracted, not focused on God. And so I'd offer, in those moments when you're feeling far from God, Scripture tells, tells us to be still and know that I am the Lord. So I'd, I'd offer, you have to carve that time out and give it to God. Just be still, be quiet, turn all the distractions off and just listen. Just listen and pray. Like, give him that quiet time. Because the quiet, vi- the quiet voice of God is really hard to hear in the noise of the world. You have to c- just spend time with God and be quiet. So I'd offer, when you're looking for guidance and you're feeling far from God, give him that time, give him the quietness, and he will speak to you if you open your heart. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for allowing us to come together again this morning. I pray as we go forward uh, that we keep seeking your face, that we give you the time. Uh, for you to speak to us and to not get distracted with all the noise in the world to listen for your voice and then have the wisdom to listen and then the courage to follow because you love us more than we know if we follow you that will take us your plan, we have no idea what your plans are you will take us far farther than we uh, ever imagined now let's pray for Pastor Lee as he preaches the message this morning that you, know, you speak through him in your name, amen Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a praise offering. Amen. Praise the Lord. Turn to somebody and say, Jesus is enough. Amen. You guys can be seated this morning. I want to continue this series, Hammer and Nails. Everybody say, Hammer and Nails. Uh, I, as I was getting ready, I was reminded of a, a, a time in my life. I was about nine years old, and I was a little league baseball player. I was a pitcher, right? Anybody else was a pitcher? Anyone? No one else was the pitcher. Everybody else was the batter. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. And uh, so I, I, was, I was pretty good. I just got to tell you, just, you know, I'm not bragging on myself. I'm just speaking the truth. I was pretty good. And, and so we, I was in a little town called Wolferth, right? Everybody say Wolferth. Right, you can tell that's a little West Texas town by the name, Wolferth. And we made it into the playoffs, and we had to play the big city, Lubbock. And they, they, they were a whole lot better than we were. And, uh, and I was the pitcher. I was, I was the best pitcher we had. And so I was up there pitching. And I mean, I was giving him all. I, had, I mean, I had so many. I had fastball. I had a curveball. Why are you saying no to me, Rich? You, I, had, I had a knuckleball. I had a spitball. I guess that's it. That's all I had. And so, but anyway, I'm, I'm pitching. And, and, it see, and I'm throwing the ball. Home run, throwing a one, home run, and I'm just like ah. And so the coach comes out and he says, "How you doing?" I said, "Not good." <laughs> it's like twelve to one, and they've hit twelve home runs. And and so he said, "Just just stay in there. You're fine. You're fine." And I mean, he gave me a good. You know when your coach gives you a good talking to, and you're like, oh, you just you know. So he did that, and I get up there, and I'm ready, man, and I'm staring the guy down. I'm 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 killing him with my eyes, you know what I'm saying? And I, and I reached back. My best pitch was a knuckleball. It kind of floated in there. It didn't move, and they thought it was coming fast. And so I, I threw that thing, and there it goes. And I said, "Woo! he's going to miss this. Out again. I called timeout. I said, Coach, it ain't going well. That's all I got. And he said, no, he said, you're, you're fine. I said, it is 12 to 1, Coach. Can you not see? And they've hidden nearly 10 home runs at that time. And, and, and so he said, no, you're going to stay in. you got to stay in. I did not want to stay in. I started looking at the crowd. Everybody was downcast. Everybody's like, oh, we're losing everything. The season's over. And I thought, it's me. I'm messing it up. And, and I thought, I can't do this anymore. You ever been in that place? You think, I just can't do it anymore. And I told the coach, I can't do it, coach. And he said, you're going to stay here and you're going to do it. So I did what every nine-year-old boy does when they're in Little League. I started crying. 
I cried and tears came down and he said, okay, now you can quit. And so I went over there and I'm in the dugout and I'm just crying and they send the next guy out and he's our second best pitcher. And we only had one inning left. That was it. You know what the final score was? This is the truth. 23 to one. So I had pitched five innings. They'd only scored 12, but in one inning they scored the rest. And, and afterwards the coach said, now do you see? And I said, see what? I'm wiping tears out of my eyes still. He said, you were doing better than you think. I think one day you're going to get to heaven. And you're going to look back on life and you're going to look at all these places where you feel like you failed miserably. And God's going to say, but what you didn't see is how much was coming against you. You had no idea how much was coming against you and you did way better than you think you did. Amen. And so if you don't get anything else today, I want you to go home knowing you're doing better than you think. Amen. Turn to somebody saying you're doing better than you think. Amen. Now, I, I want to continue this. The, the mystery behind the hammer and nails. The mystery. Everybody say mystery. Right? The mystery. Uh, it, it is really found in Genesis 3, 15, when the devil has slithered in in the garden and he has done what he has done. And God speaks to him and he says, there's going to come a day when you will strike the heel of the woman's son and he will crush your head. Now, if the devil had not have struck, he would not have been near enough for Jesus to crush his head. It was actually the striking. It was the pain. It was the suffering. It was the battle between Jesus and the spirit of death that gave him the opportunity to crush the head of the serpent. Amen? And so the secret that I'm trying to teach you is that every time you suffer, every time the enemy comes against you in whatever form, whatever fashion, it is pregnant with the opportunity to crush the head of the serpent again and again and again so that you grow in faith, that you grow in, in, in love, that you grow in peace. This is the mystery. We don't like suffering. We don't like it when things go wrong. But every moment is God saying, this moment you can come out different than how you went in. Amen? And so this is the mystery that I'm talking about. And if you want to follow in your notes, it's on your app or it's in the, the QR code there in front of you. The mystery behind the hammer and nails is God is working every attack to increase our faith, strength, and power. Amen? Do you believe that this morning? Now, that should change how you deal with suffering. That should change how you deal with problems. That should change how you deal with pain. That should change how you deal with that person in your family you don't really like. Can I get an amen? Don't look at them, right? Don't look at them. It, it should change the way we live our life. And so I want to read this scripture uh, that we've been focusing on the last few weeks out of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. And the Apostle Paul, he says, We do, however, speak a message of wisdom. Everybody say wisdom. Among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare a wisdom, a mystery, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Look what he says. It's been a mystery until now. Once the Holy Spirit came, even on the road to Emmaus, when Jesus is, is speaking, he is revealing this mystery. And it says, it is for your glory. Everybody say Glory. Glory is the evidence of the goodness of God on your life. And so what he's saying is with every attack, every problem, every issue, every minute of your life that is difficult, God wants to glory in you. In other words, he wants to put his, his goodness in you so that in the midst of your pain, the way you respond reflects the character of God. Amen? Amen? So, so that whatever you're going through, you're, you're on the road and somebody cuts you off, he says, reflect the glory of God. Amen? Now, I don't mean honk at them and say, Jesus is going to get you, brother. That's, that's different. That's different. But, but the glory of God, the love, the peace, the, the truth, right? It, it, whatever you're struggling with, whatever you're going through, if it is painful, he wants you to reflect the, so that other people look at your life and say, there's something different about them. 
They have a peace that is beyond my understanding. In the middle of what they're going through, they ought to be depressed, angry, bitter, divorced, insane. They ought to be somewhere else. But instead, God has given them joy and peace and love, and, and they're able. And, and so God wants you to. So whenever you're struggling, just start beginning to think, how can I reflect the glory of God? Amen? Amen? All right. Sounds like y'all are listening. Let me keep going there. All right, let me keep reading this. In, 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 uh, in the same scripture, it says, however, everybody say however. As it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. Amen. So in your notes there, God is using suffering to prepare you for what he has planned for you. Amen. This is how he gets you ready. I assume when you got up this morning, you had a routine. And you had to hit the alarm clock. And then the snooze. And then the snooze. And then the snooze. And then the Holy Spirit said, get up! But you got a routine, and you had to get ready. And probably when you get ready in the morning, you do the same thing. It's the same ritual. You do the same thing every time. I blow dry my hair first thing. Because it doesn't take me very long at all. So I'm done. But you got to get ready. And so what God is saying, this is part of the routine. You don't like it, but I can't get you ready without pain. The suffering actually prepares you. It changes your mind, changes your heart, changes your posture in a spiritual way so that you're actually ready to receive what I have for you. Amen? And I don't know about you, but I want all that he's got for me. I don't want to live halfway. I don't want to half enjoy it. I want all that God has for me, amen? And so if, if I have to suffer, then I should say, bring it on. If this is how I get ready. So he is using it to get you ready in order that he can do everything that he wants you to do. And here's the thing. Remember, in the Old Testament, God said to Israel, you're going to take over all this land. Do you know Israel never got close to taking all that land? I do not want to go to heaven. And God said, look, here's what I intended for your life to be, and this is all you did. I said, Lord, I want all of it. Amen. Not for my glory, but for his glory. Amen. And so he is, he is doing that. He is trying to get you ready. So when you're in pain, anybody in pain today, anybody going through a problem, anybody suffering, then you need to know that is a sign that God's getting you ready for something. God's getting you ready for something. Amen. Somebody say amen. Help me out a little bit here, right? Because we don't like him. But, it, but imagine if I could think that God's getting me ready to elevate me, to increase me, to, to enlarge my territory, to do something good for me. Not because of me, but because of him. People say, well, he couldn't have done that on his own. It must be God. I'm okay with that. Amen? And, and so if that's the case, then we ought to pray. The next time you're in a fight with your wife, just say, praise God. God's getting me ready for something. Amen? You should really try that and then send me an email. Let me, let me know how that goes. He's getting you ready. Now, here in your notes now, every blessing, everybody say every blessing. Every blessing you get, every blessing given by God is accompanied by the temptation of pride. Every blessing. Any, because every blessing you get is through you. Is, is, is something happening in you? Amen? When, when I was in college just a few short years ago, I, I did blow dry my hair. And, and, I, and I had long, beautiful, I mean like the mane of a horse hair, gorgeous <laughs> curls everywhere. And I had it long, and I would take the hair dryer, and I would blow a wall I got a punk rock wall right there, and I use a can of hairspray every day. And I used to walk around there, whew, man, I look good. <laughs> God gave me hair, the Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. <laughs> he said, you like your hair, do you? You think you look pretty good? Let me see how you look now. See, everything you get, whatever it is, you get a job, you can start doing good at your job, and you think, whew, look how good I'm doing. I am pretty good. God gave you a mind. You think, man, I'm smarter than my sister. I know that for sure. Right? Whatever you get it is a temptation to elevate yourself in your own mind. You think, if, if this is happening through me, then there must be something about me. 
in every blessing. So God says, I have a plan for you. I want to bless you, but I got to get you ready. I got to get you ready, amen? Because every blessing comes with a temptation of pride. And so what is God going to do? It's in your notes here. To prepare you for this great plan, God must transform you in deep humility. Right? Because if, if I am prideful, then everything good God does for me, I'm going to go around and act like it's me. And I'm going to tell everybody it's me. I did it. You can't. So, so, so. I'm good. You're not. And, and, and I can walk around. And, and you know people. There, there are people who are Christians, but in their mind, they still think good of themselves. There's still a pride issue. And so they're saying glory to God, but they're walking around like, whew, I'm better than you. I'm a better Christian than you are. I'm a better dad than you are. One, one of the temptations of, of growing in Christ is our life begins to change, and the temptation of pride comes along because then we look at other people and say, well, why aren't you changing? I quit drinking a year ago. Why can't you quit? And we forget it took us 20 years to get there. And we start thinking, well, I got my marriage back together. Why are you divorced? I got this. And and it is so easy. And so pride becomes this place that if God blesses me and I'm prideful, all it does is turn people off to God. It doesn't glory God. It glories me and there's no glory in me. And all it does is make people not want to be around me. It doesn't help at all. So in order to to make this great plan happen, he's got to transform me in humility. He's got to get me to the place where I take no credit. Amen. No credit. I did not do it. God did it. Amen. You, I used to have a hard time after a sermon. Somebody come up and say, that was a great message, Pastor. I said, I know. No, I didn't say that. I said, yeah. but, but sometimes I would think it. I was like, yeah, I, I brought the fire today, baby. <clears throat> and I, w- I was preaching in a, in a youth conference one time with hundreds of teenagers. And I would speak in the morning, speak at night. And, and in between, I would, after the morning service, I'd get ready for the evening service. And man, I had been preaching my heart out and the altars were full and people were coming to the Lord. And, and so I went off in the afternoon. I was getting ready for that evening. And the Holy Spirit said this to me. He said, you think you're pretty good, don't you? And I said, yes, I do. And he reminded me, he said, at best, all you can do is plagiarize me. That's the best you can ever be. Is you can plagiarize me. You don't have an original thought. There's nothing that can come out of your mouth that didn't come from me and a hundred other preachers before you. And, and he was trying to get me to the place. Because if I kept going and got prideful, it would ruin my ministry. If you start thinking you're the best husband in the world, it'll ruin your marriage. If you start thinking you're the best man in the world, it'll ruin everything. He's got to get us to the place where God gets all the credit and we take none. Amen? He's got to get to that place. So no matter how good it is, you can say, only by the grace of God is this happening in my life. Amen? Only by the grace of God. I take no credit. It's not me. It's him. Amen? And he's got to get me there. How does he get me there? Pain. He takes your hair away. Trust me, it's painful. He takes things away. He allows the enemy to come. He strikes your heel, suffering, difficulty, heartache. And what is he doing? He's trying to remind you that you cannot live on this life and make it on your own. We need Jesus. Amen? Amen. It's, it's, um, It's this thing that no matter what's coming out of me, no matter what I'm producing, that I have a clear understanding that it's not me. And when I get to that place, then he can bless me all he wants because all I'm going to do is give him glory. But if he doesn't get me there, then I'm going to take glory. And so he's got to get me there. And so all the suffering, he's trying to humble you so he can give you more. He's trying to open up your, 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 the, the baskets of your spirit so he can just pour more into you. But the only way, this is how he gets you ready, suffering. We don't like it, but that's the reality. Amen? Now, the thing is, it's very possible to go through a season of suffering and not change. So he says, I'm going to use suffering to to transform you in humility, but it's very easy to go through suffering, and, and you go in one way, you come out the same way. You go in prideful, you come out prideful. 
You go in depressed, you come out depressed. You go in selfish, you come out selfish. It's very easy. Let me read this to you out of Romans chapter 5. This is what God desires in verse 3. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. Everybody say hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And so hope makes me fully aware of the love of God. And so he says, how am I going to get hope into you? Suffering, pain, heartache. And suffering is supposed to, to eventually create hope. But, but you can go through suffering and come out just as hopeless as you went in. And we have to understand that the, the difference is humility. When you're, when you're suffering and everything is going wrong, if you're stressing out, right, if you're just all stressed out, it's because somewhere in your mind you have taken responsibility for whatever's happening. It's my job to fix it. It's my job to fix the family. It's my job to fix the marriage. It's my job to take care of the, 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 the money. It's my job, and I don't have what it takes, so now I'm stressing out. That, that is me elevating myself as if I'm God. God said, I will provide. He didn't say, you can do it. He said, I will provide. He said, I'll give you the ability. I'll give you the mind, but I'll, when I'm stressing, I'm not trusting. Amen? Now, Another way you can go through a, a difficult time of suffering and you get hopeless. Hopelessness is also an issue of humility because what happens is I can't see a way out and I have limited to God to my perspective. And I have said, well, I can't see a way out, so God must not be able to see a way out. So God's not any more powerful than I am, so I'm stuck. And you begin to lose your hope. But when there is humility, you can say, I may not know, but God does. I may not have an answer, but he does. Amen? See, there's a difference in faith and hope. Faith is, is when you can see a solution that God could do, and you say, Lord, I have faith that you will do that thing. Hope is when everything is so bad, you can't even figure out what God might do. You look at the situation and say, Lord, I don't even know what you're going to do. I don't know how you could fix this. And if you're in that place, but you still hope, it's this idea that, that God is able to do what I can't even conceive. God is able to do more than what I can imagine. We read it all the time. God is able. But, but then when we get in the middle of the situation, we're either stressing out, thinking it's our job to be God, or we're thinking God is no greater than we are. We, we've got to get to the place where we can say that, that, Lord, no matter what is happening, even if everything is bad, I still believe you are able. I still believe you can do what I cannot see. I still believe that you are able where I'm not. You are God and I'm not. Amen? Amen? Y'all with me? There, there, are, there are so many things that we don't know. All right? Turn to your neighbor and say, you don't know everything. Some of y'all have said that before, haven't you? I don't, I don't know why the stars don't fall. I don't know why the ocean only goes so far. There are many mysteries that I don't know, but God does. Amen? I don't, I don't understand why women say they're fine when they're not. That's, it blows my mind. I don't understand why dogs will love you and cats could care less. I don't know. The, these are mysteries of the universe. But God knows. When you're in your valley and everything is falling apart or dead, he's the one who raises things back to life. It is never a lost cause. And we have to get to that place where we believe even when we can't see it. Amen? Let me keep going. Hebrews chapter 2 now. It's talking about Jesus. It says, In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of, of their salvation, that's Jesus, should make Jesus perfect through what he suffered. Amen. We're talking a lot about suffering. It's not a, ooh, that's great, Pastor. Now, God is God, and Jesus is God, and so Jesus is perfect. But Jesus took on the form of a man like me, and I am far from perfect. And so Adam was a man who messed everything up. So Jesus has got to be a man who doesn't mess up at all. And so he's got to be proven perfect. And so he had to be tested. He had to be tempted. 
In the Old Testament, when they had a Passover lamb, they would bring the lamb into their house and they would have it for seven days and they were checking it constantly. Is there any blemish? Is there any tiny little thing wrong with this lamb? Because if there was, it didn't qualify for the sacrifice. And so Jesus had to come to this earth and he was tested over and over again and he suffered. God says, I am, I am proving you're perfect by pouring out as much suffering on you as I can. And we have to remember that until Christ rose from the dead, Satan had still been given the power of death. And so when Jesus died on the cross, he got all the power of death. Everything the devil could do to him, he did. He experienced more pain than any of us ever will. He experienced it in his spirit, his mind, his emotions, his body, in every possible way, yet he never sinned. Amen. Never sin. Amen. And so now he has won the keys of the kingdom. He has won the keys of hell and the keys of death. Now he's in charge of death, not the devil. So no matter what you go through, Jesus has already said to the devil, you can only go this far in the same way that God limits the ocean. God limits the devil. So whatever you think you're going through, it is a tiny thing of what the devil wants to do. It's little, it's small, and you can rejoice because God's only allowing what is good to build you up. Amen? If he let a little bit more, you would be crushed. If he didn't give you as much as it is, you wouldn't grow. It's perfect. The suffering you're going through is the perfect amount to get you where you need to be. Oh, I don't like that, preacher. I don't like that. Now, Jesus could have quit. He could have said it's too much pain. But to do that, he would have to abandon the mission. He goes, I'm getting off the cross. I'm done. But then all of us will be stuck in hell forever. He could have said, I'm tired of people spitting in my face and pulling my beard. I'm leaving. I'm out of here. But then where would we be? You see, when you go through suffering, there is the temptation to alleviate the pain. I just want to get out of the pain. I want to get out right now. I want the suffering to stop. But in order to do that, you have to abandon the mission. Because what is the mission? To glory in our suffering. The mission is to reveal the goodness of God in your pain. God is trying to let you experience enough pain to show contrast between how good he is, and he can't do that unless there is suffering, and I have to choose to receive the suffering and not alleviate it, or I abandon the mission. I can go out and get drunk. I can, I can go out and get high. I can become a workaholic. I can become a, a religious fanatic. I can do all kinds of things trying to remove myself from the pain, but when I do that, I don't glory in him. I have to abandon the mission. Jesus, because he was a man, he had free will. So God has said, Jesus, I'm going to send you down there and you will die for these people. In the Garden of Gethsemane, we see Jesus with a choice. And so as, as the God of him knows everything he's going to experience, the man of him doesn't want to. And he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and, and the, the weight of everything and is on him, and he's sweating blood out of his sweat glands. And, and he says this to the Father, Lord, I don't want to do this. If there's any other way, if there's any other way so I don't have to hurt, if there's any other way so I don't have to be in so much pain, if there's any other way, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Amen. Amen. See, here's the thing. If I, if I miss the mystery, then my prayer in suffering is, Lord, stop the pain. Just stop the pain. Make it in. Fix it. But, but here's the thing, and I, I want to share this in your notes. In, 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 order, for, in order for us to, to, to be who we, we were supposed to be, our prayer needs to change from God, stop the pain, to not my will, but thine be done. Amen? Now, I'm not saying you can't pray for deliverance, and God is able to, to hear our prayers, and, and he wants to give you the desires of your heart. So I'm not saying, Lord, help me out of this pain. But what I am saying is that needs to be coupled with, Lord, but not my will. 
If, if, if I need to go through this, if there is no other way to get me ready for what you have, if there's no other way for me to, to reveal you to my sister, to my brother, to my aunt, to my nephew, to my husband, if there's no other way for you to do what you want to do, then not my will and thine be done. And our prayer has to change. And, and so we, we have to understand that and we have to choose to be a servant. Everybody say servant. And so Jesus chooses to be a servant. He's in this right here, and he says, I will endure the pain to keep serving you. Or he could have said, Lord, I don't want to serve you anymore, so I'm getting out of the pain. Because they go together. Pain and the mission are twins. They come out of the same womb. You can't have one without the other. Amen? So you have to choose. you got to choose to do it. Now, I want, to, I want to take you back in Scripture now to Exodus chapter 21. And I'm almost done. I'm not sure that reflected the glory. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, Exodus 21. In verse 2, he says, If you buy a Hebrew servant, so he's talking about Jewish men being enslaved by other Jew, Jewish men. He says, if you buy a Hebrew servant, he is to serve you for six years. But in the seventh year, he shall go free without paying anything. If he comes alone, he is to go free alone. But if he has a wife when he comes, she is to go with him. But if his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the woman and her children shall belong to her master, and only the man shall go free. But if the servant declares, I love my master, and I love my wife and my children, I don't want to go free. Then his master must take him before the judges, and he shall take him to the door of the doorpost and pierce his ear with an awl. That's like a real small nail. Then he will be his servant for life. When Jesus came up out of the water in his baptism, there was a voice from heaven that says, This is my son, whom I love and am well pleased. And Jesus would say, the Father has given me all things. The Father was good to Jesus. The Father anointed him with power, anointed him with love, anointed him with grace. And in that Garden of Gethsemane, it was a moment of freedom where Jesus could have said, I'm, I'm done, I'm out of here. But in that moment, he says, my, my Father has been so good to me. And, and this bride he has given me, I love this bride. And in, in essence, he said, I choose to stay a servant. And he was nailed to the wood. This is what God is doing with us. He, he's, he, God, God has set up this system in the Old Testament where somebody, the only way you could be a servant is, is if you, you fell into great debt. You owe somebody money, and they give you time and time and time, and you can't repay it. So after finally so many years, you could, you could sell yourself to that person and work it off. But even if you didn't work it all off, in seven years, you got to go free. But the other part of the law that I'm not reading today said, if you purchase another brother, you got to treat them like your own child. you got to bring them into your house. you got to live in, in, in your kid's room. They get to eat the food that your wife bakes. You got to give them clothes. You got to provide for them. Yeah, they're going to do some work for you, but you have to be exceedingly graceful to them. And if it's a man who's by himself, you know what the scripture says. It's not good for a man to be alone. So if he's by himself, give him a wife, give him your daughter, give him your sister. Let him have children. Let him enjoy this time. And so it's this weird thing where a man could be a servant and actually fall in love with his master. And, and then the law was, if, if you want to stay and if you want to keep the generosity of your master and if you want to hold on to your wife and children, then you got to stay and keep serving. But you can go free. But if you go free, you leave the house of the one who's been so good to you. And you leave the ones that he has given you. And if he chose to stay the way that was marked as they took a hammer and a nail and they nailed him to the wood. Jesus is saying this to us today. I've been so good to you. When you tried to mess your life, when you did everything you could to mess up your life, I wouldn't let you. I brought you back. 
When you weren't the mama, you, when your marriage was on the verge of divorce, I kept you together. When he walked out and you should have gone insane, I held you together. All the stuff that you've done, you have rebelled against me, you have sinned against me, you have stolen from me, and all I've done is bring you into my house and provide for you over and over and over again. And not only that, I've put people in your life that love you. I put brothers and sisters all around you. I have given you a family. I have given you a family of God so that you know that I love you. And, and, and all I'm asking is, will you stay? Will you stay? But you can only stay if you say, Lord, I will serve you. I won't abandon the mission. So in the suffering, I will glorify you. Amen. They would take the servant and they would, they would nail him to the door of his master. Jesus was crucified on the east side of Jerusalem in an area that was called the Mount of Olives because there was an olive tree grove right there. The crosses that the Romans made were made out of olive wood. So when Jesus was nailed to the cross that day, he was nailed to an olive tree. In the Old Testament, God's residence, his home, was the Holy of Holies in the temple. And when he was telling them, this is how you build the temple and this is how you build the Holy of Holies, he, he very specifically said, the doors of the Holy of Holies where my spirit resides must be made out of olive wood. And, and you have to take that wood and then you're going to carve into it trees. So if you went into the Holy of Holies, you, you went into a, a door that was olive and you were surrounded by trees that were carved into this wood. The Holy of Holies was Calvary. When Jesus was being nailed to the cross, his ear was being pierced into the, the, the door of his master. And his servant servanthood was being marked by suffering when when you say i will serve god even in the suffering when i will be a bond servant i love god so much because he's been so good to me that even when everything is bad i will not fail him i will not leave him when you love him like that when you recognize that all the good that's in your life came from god and if you leave god you're going to leave all that when you understand that all you can say is lord i will serve you for the rest of my life and then you will be marked with suffering. But the same God who nailed him to the wood raised him up out of the grave and set him up on the throne where the Bible says that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Amen. Praise his name. And what God is saying to us today is will you serve me? Because if you will, you will be marked with suffering. You'll be nailed to my door. But every moment of suffering will nail you deeper into my goodness, into my grace. And I will give you power that will lift you up out of every valley. And I will set you high upon a rock. <laughs> and so in every time, every bit of suffering, you will increase and come nearer to me. If we were to see suffering like that, how would our life change? Stand up and let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for not forcing us to serve you, but being so good to us that we almost can't help it. And church, if there's anyone here today that says, you know, I, I need to make this commitment to, to Christ. I need to give myself completely to him. Then all you got to do is pray this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive my sins. And I give you my life. And if you pray that simple prayer, the Bible says all the angels in heaven celebrate. You will be marked with suffering, but you will also be marked with glory. Heavenly Father, teach us how to receive the suffering, to be humbled, that we might serve you, that we might draw nearer to the house of God, 
all the days of our life. It's in your precious name we pray. And everyone said together, amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a praise offering. Amen. Amen. If you just said that prayer and you have prayed today to commit your life to Christ. We want to uh, we want you to leave with the gift. Over um, to my right in this back corner, we have some green bags, and in there, um, those are our fresh start bags, and in there we have a book, a Bible that will kind of get you started on your journey as you commit your life to Christ. So feel free to grab one of those as you head out if you just said that prayer. If you are a first-time guest, we are so glad that you're here with us today. We are happy to meet you. We want to meet you in the back at our Welcome Center, or I'll be out in the foyer um, just to connect with you, and how can, how can we pray for you? How can we, um, how can we lift you up? Um, that's what we're here for. We also want to bless you with the, with a gift. So um, as you head back there or out in the foyer, um, we'll we'll bless you with a gift as well. And before we leave, I do want to remind you that our mission here at Crossroads and everything we do, we are uh, what we do is we want to love people into a loving relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why we exist here as a church. Let that 